Welcome to Awake Us Now Ministries, where we share how Jesus pulls us out of the pit and offers us forgiveness, life, peace, joy, and the power to live a new life. Thanks for joining us today, and now, here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. We're going to be talking about a young woman whose life was forever changed. And as we do that, I believe we're going to see things that will speak powerfully into each one of our lives. But I'd just like to remind you how much God changes lives. I just finished reading a really fascinating book entitled A Wind in the House of Islam. It's written by David Garrison, who has interviewed over a thousand Muslim men and women of all ages who have recently come to faith in Christ. Garrison is a phenomenal researcher, a brilliant scholar, and he has examined the 82 recorded mass movements of Muslim people to faith in Jesus over the last 14 centuries. You need to know that in the first 12 centuries, there were no recorded mass movements of Muslims to faith in Jesus, not a one that we know of. But beginning in the 1800s, they started as a trickle. A mass movement is defined as a thousand people baptized and or a hundred new churches established among Muslim people. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, There were two such recorded movements for the first time in 1,300 years. In the 20th century, there were 11 recorded movements like that, most of them occurring in the last two decades of the 20th century. And in the 21st century, in the first 11 years, because that's where the figures have stopped in this book, in the first 11 years... 69 recorded mass movements of Muslim people to faith in Jesus. And it is occurring all through the Islamic world. God is moving in mighty ways. And His Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit is speaking to the hearts of people and changing people who seem to be unchangeable. Missionaries throughout the centuries have given their lives just with the the hope and the prayer of leading Muslim people to a knowledge of their Messiah. And now, all of a sudden, our God in these last days is moving in remarkable ways. And I'd like to share one example. It's the example of Ahmed. That's not his real name. His real name is protected. But this event occurred just a few years ago in a part of the world that is the most radical and the most aggressive part of the Islamic world. It happened in the area that we today know as Pakistan and Afghanistan and uh, Western India. Ahmed was a member of the Taliban. Ahmed had been chosen to kill a couple of Western missionaries, Western Christians. The end result Ahmed became a follower of Jesus in an absolutely miraculous way. But it didn't stop there. A few years ago, Ahmed was asked to be a translator at a women's gathering where wives of recently recently converted followers of Jesus would come to learn how to uh, teach their children how to read It was intended as a woman's conference, and it was going to be held in a special compound. Twelve women had been invited. Ahmed was to be the translator for two young American Christians who were going to be speaking to these Muslim women who were married to recently converted believers in Jesus. On the day that the conference was to begin, none of the twelve women showed up. Instead, these two young American women waiting for the, uh, the first arrivals were confronted by 12 men, big, burly, no smiles. They were serious. 
They were the husbands of these women. And they had decided they were not going to let their wives go to talk to any Westerners, any American women, without having checked them out first. The two young American women were wearing full coverings. They had burkas on so that you could only see out through the, uh, the mesh around their eyes. They were trying to be as respectful as possible. And the first day's teaching did not go well. The men sat there coldly, rigidly. It seemed like nothing was happening. Finally came time for the evening dinner. And of course, in this part of the world, men and women are totally segregated. The men sat at their tables, and the two young women sat by themselves until Ahmed walked up. Ahmed sat down with them, and Ahmed just casually asked them a question. Here it is. Should we stop beating our wives? At first, the two women thought it was a joke. But then they realized there was no joke about it. And in that part of the world, when a man comes to faith in Jesus, usually the last person he tells is his wife. Because if she finds out, what she will do most likely is leave him and report it to the imam. And it could mean a death sentence very easily. Anyway, Ahmed asked the question, should we stop beating our wives? And the women, after chuckling to themselves, came to the realization he was being absolutely serious. And they said, we will text you. After praying to God, we will text you some verses for the Bible that, from the Bible that you might want to think about. And so that night, the two women returned to their room, and they began texting verses from Scripture like these. At the beginning, he made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Be kind and compassionate to one another, as God has shown us that same kindness in Christ. The women madly texted Bible passages to Ahmed until all of the power went down. They returned the next morning wondering what would happen when they gave the second day's presentation. And they were absolutely overwhelmed by what awaited them. Here, waiting for them, was Ahmed, along with 12 men who had obviously been awake all night long. Ahmed told the two young women that they had stayed up the whole night and pondered and talked about those verses. They had prayed to God, and now they had confession to make. And one by one, they came up before these women. The first man came up and averted his eyes so that neither the women nor his fellow new believers could see the tears flowing down his face. And he said, I have treated women shamefully. And earlier in my life, I killed them. And I have treated my wife in a horrendous way, and I repent, God. I repent. And one by one, those 12 individuals came forward and said, Lord, have mercy on me. I will never do this again. Give me strength to love her as you have loved me. It is absolutely countercultural to what they had grown up with. In that part of the world, many men never even speak to their wives. And now, these 12 men plus Ahmed went home, resolved after one night in 2008, having heard the word of God and seen the grace of Christ and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, they went home and said it will never be the same again. Amen, Amen is right. But let me ask you a question. 
What power in all of the world can possibly accomplish that kind of total transformation in a night? I believe there is only one answer. It is the power of the living God. It is the power of the risen Jesus. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit. And those men who came there just to see what was going on left having seen what is going on. Our God is moving. And he is moving in the lives of people all over the world in the most unlikely of places. And he desires to move in the life of every person. And that's what we're going to read about this morning. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles today to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. This is what we read. This is the story of Jesus' encounter with a woman of Samaria, an individual who was hated by the Jews and who hated them in return. This is what we read. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Jesus is on what was known as the Road of the Patriarchs. It was the very ancient road that had been traveled centuries earlier by Abraham, by Isaac, And by Jacob. And now we read, walking along that road, a three day journey from Judea up to Galilee, Jesus came, verse 5, to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And then verse 10. Look at this closely, folks. And I'd encourage you to mark it in your Bible. This is really important. And we're going to be circling back to it in a little while. But then we read verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is speaking to this lady. Keep in mind, this too is incredibly countercultural. In that part of the world, like much of the ancient world and much of the world today, Men and women do not speak to one another in public. Even husbands do not speak to their wives in public. But Jesus always breaks the conventions. And he speaks to this woman who is at the well in the middle of the day. Ask yourself the question, why was she there at that time and why does John mention it? We don't give a second thought to that. But people of Jesus' day would have known immediately what that was all about. Women always went to the well early in the morning and at dusk. They went there to gather the water for the day and to gather water for the evening. They also went to chat because they met other ladies there and they could talk and have a good time. It was social time. No one went to the well in the middle of the day. That just wasn't the time to go. This is a lady who's broken. This is a woman who's trying to hide from others. This is a woman who does not want to show her face in public. And can you imagine how she is blown away when all of a sudden this Jewish man, obviously devout, walks up to her after having been seated on the wall and says, would you please get me a drink of water? And she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? Jesus said, if you knew who you were talking to, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water means spring water. Living water is pure water. In fact, in the temple sacrifices, only living water could be used to purify an unclean person to participate in the gifts and offerings of God. 
My people, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug for themselves cisterns that can't even hold water. And Jesus says to this woman, if you knew the gift of God, if you only knew the gift of God and who you're talking to, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, I will tell you this. In most commentaries and in most study Bibles, the notes usually say something like this. What Jesus was referring to here is receiving salvation or having life forever. I believe that is true. But I also believe it only is a portion of the truth. I believe Jesus is talking about far more here. And I pray that as we look at the word together, you will come to that same conclusion, that he is speaking about much more than simply knowing that Christ died for me and that I'll be with him forever in eternity. He is talking about far more when he talks about living water. And I believe it is demonstrable from this book of the New Testament as well as from the rest of the New Testament. From the words of Jesus recorded here in John 4 and also from the words of Jesus recorded in John 3 and 7 and 14 and 15, and 16, and 17, and by the way, 20 and 21 as well, not to mention 18, and uh, that's not to forget chapter 5 either. So hang on to this verse, and now let's move on. Sir, verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? By the way, the English translation doesn't fully capture what these words really say in the original. The Greek uses a construction that basically demands a negative answer. And what this woman is in effect saying is, Surely you're not greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and used it to water his flocks, are you? She's basically saying, who do you think you are? (laughs) And then we read Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sounds good, doesn't it? And it did to her too, even though she didn't have a clue yet as to what he was talking about. She said, Sir, verse 15, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Great answer. Great answer. You know, there there are direct answers to direct questions. And then there are uh, what you would call oblique answers to direct questions. That's where you give part of the answer without the whole story. (laughs) Jesus says to her, call your husband, and we can talk about this together. We'll do this in a culturally appropriate fashion. And she says, well, I I, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you've spoken the truth. Listen to this. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. How gracious he is. But how direct. And dear friends, that's the way our Lord deals with us too. On this foggy morning, Jesus cuts through the fog. He cuts through the fog and he gets to the heart of the issue. But he doesn't do it in a mean or mean-spirited or hurtful or harmful way. His desire 
is that we know the Father's love. His desire is that we experience the fullness of God's Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've actually had five. And the man you're living with now, he's not your husband, is he? And she says, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> I per- don't you wonder what tone of voice she used when she said that? I perceive that you're a prophet. And then immediately she goes on. Some have suggested she was trying to say, change the subject. That may well be. But this is what she says. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus is very straightforward with her. He will not be taken off on a tangent by an argument over who's got the truth, which denomination is the correct one, or anything like that. Instead, Jesus simply says, listen, listen, salvation is from the Jews. That was the Father's plan from the very beginning. Through Abraham's seed, he would bring blessings to the nations. But Jesus also says the days are coming. When you will worship God, not on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, where the the Samaritans worshiped, nor even on Temple Mount, where the Jewish people worshiped. In fact, as Stephen, the first individual to be executed for his faith in Christ, would say in one of the most powerful sermons ever preached, God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. God desires to engage the heart. He desires to get right to the heart of the issue, even as Jesus gets to the heart of the issues in this woman's life. And it is at that point that we read the following. Jesus said, verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come. In other words, not only is the day coming, but for you, The day has arrived. And that is what God says to us too. Not only is the day coming, but now is the day of our salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. The day is now. Jesus says to her, the time is coming and is now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Then verse 24, and this is where we're going to camp. Verse 24, we're going to put it up here on the screen. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. Now maybe you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, uh, my Bible says worship him in spirit and in truth. How come this one is capitalized? This is the new NIV. And spirit is capitalized. And the natural question is, when you compare it to almost all other translations, why did they capitalize this when they put it out in 2011? Here's the answer. In fact, if you'd like to read more about it, there's 12 pages of notes available online from the translators of the new NIV as to why they did things. And they specifically explain why they capitalize spirit, both here and a number of other places. And at the heart of their reasoning is this. In the Greek New Testament, you cannot tell the difference between spirit with a small s or spirit with a capital S. There is no distinguishing in ancient Greek between lowercase and uppercase letters. The way you determine is by the context. And one of the things that we have learned, especially in the last few years, you know, God is, God is unleashing, unleashing incredible things in our world today, unprecedented in the history of this planet since Pentecost. 
And one of the things that he has unleashed, along with bringing the most unexpected of peoples to faith in Christ and the greatest revival the world has ever seen in all of its history, among the things he has released is knowledge. And here is the latest knowledge. In the ancient world, from all the manuscripts that we possess, it is rare to use the Greek word pneuma or spirit to refer to simply the human spirit. Instead, that word is almost always used to refer to the spirit of God. And so the translators, whenever the context would suggest that this should be capitalized, they've said, we're going to do it. And do you realize what a difference that conveys? God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. If you simply say the spirit and truth, you get the idea, well, it ought to be sincere. But God is looking for far more than sincerity. You can be sincerely wrong with eternal consequences. What God is looking for is what only He can provide. And that is the spirit of holiness. The spirit of the living God. And the truth. What is the truth? Well, one of the things we say, well, it's the Bible. It's a person. Don't get me wrong. The Bible is the truth. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who speaks to you, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Jesus is saying He is the one who comes from the Father to give us everything. And that is His life, His death, His resurrection. And as He said... Wait in Jerusalem until you received the gift of the Father, which I've promised you, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're saying to yourself, well, isn't that putting, you know, a little bit more into this than than should be there? I would remind you, that is exactly what the scripture has said all along. What did we read in John chapter 1? John the Baptist came, and what did he say? He said, I baptize you with water. But when I baptized him, I saw the Spirit of God descending upon him. And the Father told me, the one whom you see, the Spirit descend on him as the dove. He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. What did we see in John chapter 3? Jesus speaks to a religious leader, the exact opposite of this woman. This woman is a false worshiper and a woman with a broken family. Whereas Nicodemus came from the finest of families and was a, the, uh, the ultimate of Bible scholars. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and the Spirit. And Jesus goes on as we move through the Gospel of John to talk about that. But listen to these words in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, John seven thirty-seven. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the Scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus, the Jesus who speaks here is the same Jesus. The words we are reading are in the same book. They are written down by the same author. And what does Jesus say he will do? Whoever believes in him will receive what? Rivers of living water. Living water. Those are the same words in the same book by the same author out of the mouth of the same Jesus. And they are the same words that we saw earlier in John 4.10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who speaks to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So ask yourself the question, what is the living water? John gives us the answer. John chapter 7, verse 39. Jesus had just said, 
Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. What does it mean to worship God truly? It is to worship God because of the gift God has given, the Spirit and truth. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He reveals the truth of God. The Holy Spirit in John is described as the Spirit of truth who will reveal all things to you. How do we worship God in spirit and in truth? The answer is, we worship God in the spirit and in truth by coming through Jesus Christ who was slain and raised for us, who is returning soon, and who pours out His Holy Spirit, the stream of living water into the life of all who believe. That is why the scriptures repeatedly say, why Jesus repeatedly says, Ask, keep on asking literally and you will receive. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you because everyone who is asking receives and everyone who is seeking will find and everyone who is knocking, the door will be opened. And what the Lord is saying is that true worship comes not simply because we've shown up on a particular morning to sing a few songs, look at a couple of Bible passages, utter a few prayers, and then go back to life as usual. Jesus says, if you know the gift of God and who it is who is encountering you, you would ask him and he will pour out streams of living water. By this, he meant the Holy Spirit. That's what it is saying. And that is what the rest of the New Testament scriptures declare loudly and repeatedly. God is calling us in these last days to move beyond mere words and standing and sitting and speaking about him. He is calling us in these last days to encounter him, to know him in all of his fullness, to experience the fullness of the spirit of the living God in our lives, to realize that our father is a good, good father, as we sang earlier, that he loves his children, that no matter how much we may have gone through in our lives, no matter how broken our hearts may have been, no matter how deep our anger and how great our frustration He is a good, good father and he loves his children and he will spare no expense, including his only son, to redeem and restore and remake his creation. And what we are looking forward to is not simply time with him in eternity. What we're looking forward to is time with him now. Jesus says, whoever believes in me has already passed from death to life. Eternal life is not something that happens somewhere down the road. Eternal life starts today. And it will be fully manifested when Jesus our Lord returns. But make no mistake about it. He is good. And he loves his children. And he wants us to experience daily his presence His Holy Spirit, His truth, Jesus the Savior. And boy, Jesus' next words, they make that so clear. Let's go back to John 4. We've been camped on John 4, 24. Now listen to 25 and 26. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes to us, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The Greek text literally reads, then Jesus said, I am. I am. 
What did the father say to Moses when he encountered him on Mount Sinai in the burning bush? I am who I am. If anyone asks you who sent me to you, you say, I am has sent me to you. The woman says, when Messiah comes, he'll explain all of this to us. And Jesus says, ego e me. I am. I am. He is the living God. He is the Father's Son, the second person of the Trinity, sent to redeem the life of every individual and to restore us into the very image of our Creator. That's what the book of Colossians says. And His desire is to do that. Not simply at the end of the world and the return of Christ. But now, today, the time is coming. In fact, it has already arrived when the Father will show himself in our lives. And he does that through the Son and through the Spirit. And he offers to you and to me a new life every day. If you know him and follow him, then he desires to keep on renewing and transforming you. If you have never encountered him personally, even though you may have been in church all of your life, even though you may have a Bible on your coffee table and you know, may know some hymns by heart, his desire is to encounter you. Just as Jesus encountered this woman, And he will cut through all of the fog and he desires to get directly to your heart and to mine and show us himself. Jesus said, as the scripture says, whoever believes in me out of his or her heart will flow rivers of living water. By this, he meant the spirit and that's a promise to you and to me, today and tomorrow, until he returns. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we confess you are a good, good father. You love us, your children. And we receive that and believe that because you have proven that. We thank you for our Lord Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. We thank you for him who is manifested among us, who bore our sins and carried our diseases, who paid the price for our rebellion, who was stripped and mocked and beaten so that we might never have to face divine judgment before you. We thank you for him who has risen from the grave. We thank you for the fact that in these last days, we see the signs before us everywhere we look that he is coming soon. And so we delay not. We hesitate not. We pause not. Instead, we respond to him who is the divine yes, the holy I am. And we say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I believe and receive your promises of the Holy Spirit to all who believe. I will seek you with all my heart. I will follow you with all my life. I will go where you tell me to go. I will do what you desire me to do. I repent of those times I've tried to live life on my own terms in my own way, ignoring what you have had to say all along. And I pray, Father, I pray that you would fill me this day anew with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would continue your work in me, in each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. 
For questions about today's message or other faith questions, contact us at mail at awakeusnow.com. For more information on Awake Us Now or to learn about our free resources and materials, visit our website at awakeusnow.com. Need prayer? We have real people who will spend real time praying your prayer request. To submit a prayer, visit the prayer page of our website, awakeusnow.com. We invite you to follow us on our Awake Us Now Ministries Facebook page for encouraging, inspirational, and shareable postings. Again, thank you for joining us today. And remember, when we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I believe you are my Savior. He is there, and he receives us with open arms.